the placenta is like a unique organ because it is it's invasive. And in what way does that invasion into our bodies like impact our overall well-being as uh, pregnant people? The best way to think about a human fetus is a blood-sucking demon fetus. It's just like incredibly invasive. And welcome back. You're listening to Hysteria, the podcast for people who know why men have nipples and will gladly volunteer this information at a work function. Our guest today is a writer and researcher with a PhD from Columbia University and a New York Times bestselling book called Eve, How the Female Body Drove 200 Million Years of Human Evolution, which I just read and absolutely loved. Cap O'Hannon, welcome to Hysteria. Thanks for the compliment. I like those. It was fascinating book. And it was one of those books that as I was reading it, I kept yelling to my husband, hey, did you know that we grew nipples? Because like he, yeah, he was really like, he was like, what about my nip though? And are about, are you about to do something fun? Because I could be done with that, but I can't tell if that's the moment right now. Yeah. Right, right. What's the vibe? What's going on? Um, Kat, what prompted you to write this book? I understand the project took years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a decade in my life. This book is like crawling inside my head in my 30s, which is a weird place to be in any American woman's head, right? Like in our (laughs) 30s. Yeah. Well, I was already doing a PhD at Columbia University in a semi-related topic. Not really. Evolution of narrative cognition. I was into I was into brains. I was into brains in a like professional way. Um, But in this case, it was because I learned about the male norm that mostly we're studying male bodies in biology and biomedical science. And I was like, well, that's some crap. Uh, And then I also realized the more I read around that just nobody was telling the chick side of the story in human evolution, Um, all the way down into hominins and early mammals. It's like, oh, we've just left out half of all mammals. Maybe we should rectify that. While you were deep in the research zone, were you a lot of fun or the most fun at parties? I mean, I'd like to say I'm always the most fun at parties, but that's Uh probably not true. We tell ourselves that to make it through parties. You know what I mean? Uh That's how we don't run away from the party. You're like, I'm so fun right now. But no, I'm fun. I'm being fun. What's the most surprising thing you learned about the female mammalian body while you were researching this book? The least surprising thing I found out is that we are absolute crap at making babies. Um, The most surprising thing I found out um, is probably that the male human penis is boring. And then there's a lot in between there. Let's talk about how bad we are at giving birth. You said that was the least surprising thing that you kind of already knew. What did you learn additionally about why we're so bad at it and why being pregnant is the worst? So being pregnant is the worst. Giving birth is the worst. Postpartum is the worst. This is actually the worst. I think we can say this and support the magical strength of the human body without calling a vag a yoni. Like, I think we can actually admit that this is terrible. This is a flaming garbage pile and admit that actually biology supports that statement, right? So, okay, we have terrible pregnancies. It's not just in your head, ladies, if you've ever been pregnant. No, 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 no. Like we are... Pregnancies and births and postpartum recoveries are longer and harder and more prone to dangerous murdery complications for mother and offspring than they are for most other primates, except for like a squirrel monkey and we feel bad for her. But like compared to most mammals, we suck at this. Now, don't go on the internet and look up what hyenas have to do. That's also terrible. But again, for us, for our evolution, this is bad. There are two reasons why it's bad. One, we have a really small pelvic opening compared to the size of our babies. Okay. We're trying to fit a watermelon thing out of a lemon sized hole. So if you've met fruit, it's not, it's not good. It's not a good situation, (laughs) right? So that's called the obstetric dilemma. And we know that we have had that for about 3.2 million years since Lucy, furry little chick, Australopithecine. She had the same problem we do. Giant babies, little hole. She had a midwife just like we do, right? So Hmm. the history of gynecology is 3.2 million years old, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The other problem is that we have this crazy, super invasive placenta. That's the kind of wet, gross docking station where your umbilical cord like connects to the uterus. Mm -hmm. Like that. I had mine mine made into pills and I took them. You did? My placenta. Yeah. Okay. I I want to support you. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, most other mammals, as you say in the book, most other mammals eat them. Like the bonobos gather around and like share the placenta as a reward for helping with the birth. So in a way, I'm a bonobo, right? 
In a way, in a way, I mean, you're probably not in that case a lot like the bonobo because the bonobos actually do genital rubbing with their babies. So unless you're doing sexual stuff with your kids. No, there's a lot of ways that we're not (laughs) at all like the bonobo, nor should we choose to be. It's cool. Uh So it was your choice to eat the placenta and I want to support you. It didn't necessarily improve your health, um, but that's okay. But you can now tell people you did that. And I'm guessing you made it into pills because you didn't feel like pan frying a thing while you were postpartum in diapers. Like that wasn't a future you wanted for yourself. No, I didn't want my house to smell like fried placenta. That was, uh, no, candles, not fried placenta. I don't even know what the smell of fried placenta would be. I assume like ham. I assume it my, would be like ham steak. I'm not my, sure. Uh, my doula said, who is the one who like did, did, did the like encapsulation or whatever, she says it smells like liver a little bit. It's like a real meaty, rich... Organ. There's a lot that of has blood a lot going on. Yeah, it's, it's like a lot of blood vascular. vessel, a lot like a liver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the placenta is like a unique organ because it is it's invasive. And in what way does that invasion into our bodies like impact our overall well being as uh, pregnant people? I think the way I describe it in the book, uh, the best way to think about a human fetus is a blood sucking demon fetus. It's just like incredibly invasive, right? Now there are different species that have different type of placentas, right? Like most of us have kind of shallow affairs that just kind of pop off when it's time to give birth, just like a little disc, like not a big deal. But there are some species like us that have maternal and Uh, embryonic blood vessels all intertwined, all freaking tangled up. Their uh, placenta actually invades the mother's bloodstream in a really deep, exactly as worrying as it sounds kind of way. And what that means is um, we have a really metabolically costly pregnancy that has long evolved to kind of hoover up as many resources as it can from the maternal body. Meanwhile, you have a maternal body that has long evolved to stay alive, just stay alive as much as it can, right? Which means they're actually in conflict. One body of resources in the maternal body, two bodies trying to access those resources and stay alive, right? So there's actually more of like a trench warfare in a pregnancy like that. It's more of a detente that lasts about nine months and you don't want either side to win too much and hopefully it all ends without too much blood and tears. Like that's that's actually our pregnancy. The knock-on effects of it though, Oh, God, it's hard to even know how to bound that, like scientifically, metaphorically, like it affects our immune system because it has to downregulate our immune system so that the uterus doesn't react in the normal way, which is like, oh, God, this is cancer. Get it out of me. Right. That would be the normal way if a uterus could talk. Right. So you had to turn down that dial and say, "Okay, this is not cancer for now. For now, not cancer. Accept this for now. Right. But it also has to like affect our blood pressure and it affects our bodies actually from the moment we're born. It's not like it's our destiny as a female person to be pregnant, but we've long evolved with these dig- dangerous pregnancies. So that means we have fail safes. We have things our bodies build our whole lifetimes to just survive it. And speaking of fail safes, I learned a lot about periods from your book. Oh, yeah. Um, cheers. Yeah. I, I remember being a little girl and being told, like, your body makes your uterus into essentially like a nice little pillow. Oh, to yeah. To welcome. It's so cute. The little, yeah, welcome little, it's like a little bed for the zygote to just like cuddle up in and, or blastocyst and then implant in the, in the uterine wall. But that's not the case at all. What, what is a period actually? So uh, we think about periods as the stuff we can see, which is this admittedly not very attractive material that comes out of the vag at a certain periodicity, a certain rate. We're going to just have things come out the vag that are bloody and have some tissue and mucus. And we're like, cool, I guess that's just normal. But it's not the coming out of the vag part that's really interesting biologically. Um, It just turns out to be more like metabolically efficient to just get rid of it rather than reabsorb it. Some other species just reabsorb it. All mammals have an estrus cycle. All mammals will build up their uterine lining for one reason or another. What's unusual about us as a species and a few other species that menstruate the way we do is that we start building up our lining before we even get a signal from like a fertilized egg rolling down the tube. In other words, we start getting ready, building up that uterine lining before we even need it. And why? Because it's a trench. It's a it's a warfare. It's a buffer. OK, because if we didn't do that, that incredibly invasive placenta that if there is a fertilized egg is going to build in there is going to just wreck all kinds of havoc. And you don't want that. 
You don't want that. It's a self-protective measure. In other words, the, re the reason we have periods is because our bodies have evolved to try to survive our terrible pregnancies. And other species that have periods the way we do, this technical term is spontaneous desiduation, but unless you're an academic, that's not gonna come up. When you're drunk, that's that's gonna get real slurred, just call periods, <laughs> right? You know, mm -hmm. is because our placentas are really invasive, which is hmm. exactly part of why our pregnancies and our births and recoveries are so dangerous. Because if you're not just popping off a shallow thing, if you're detaching this deeply embedded, deeply enmeshed thing from the wall of your uterus, well, that's a lot of tearing. And of course, one of the big threats is just bleeding, just maternal mm -hmm. bleeding. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really uh, metal. I, I found pregnancy is incredibly metal and birth is incredibly metal. In the mm -hmm. book, you... You ha you put forth this really interesting theory that civilization was enabled by a collective effort to make birth more survivable, aka gynecology. Can you kind of go into that theory? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think for a second like an evolutionary biologist, right? If a there are some problems that aren't that big a deal in a body plan, and then there are some problems which are called a hard problem, right? So being bad at making babies like having a terrible survival rate, which actually in our non-gynecological state we do, uh, is a hard problem. Like you can limp around on one foot, you can have a weird set of eyes, you can like have a lot of snot for some reason. But if you can't regularly make babies without both maternal body and infant body surviving at a respectable rate, well, you're heading for extinction or a weird little like ecological pocket that eventually goes extinct when enough about the world changes that it doesn't support that crazy thing you're doing anymore, right? So if that was our situation in our ancestral state, if that's what Lucy had to deal with, we don't know exactly when our placentas became terrible, but we do know when the pelvic opening became terrible. That was about 3.2 million years ago. But the bigger our babies became, more than likely the more invasive the placenta. So, you know, it follows, in other words. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, then that's the most important thing we had to solve, dude. Like, it wasn't that we needed to invent fire. That didn't come online for another million years or two. Like, no, 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 no. What we needed to do is figure out how to survive this terrible thing, right? That was our most important problem to solve. And we solved it by inventing gynecology. We solved it by helping a sister out, quite literally, sometimes a daughter, usually a sister, right? We figured it out by using every single bit of our hominin trait that we usually praise, how clever we are, how good at problem solving, how collaborative, how we worked around our murdery instincts by helping each other give birth, right? Some of that is literally helping get the baby out. Some of it is actually making you less fertile at some periods of your life and more in others. Everything that falls under the umbrella of gynecology, including rudimentary birth control, helped more of us survive and thrive. Dude, and that's exactly why anti-choice politicians aren't trying to roll the, back, the clock back like 50 years. They're trying to roll it back 3.2 million. This is a big part of our success story because if giving birth is dangerous, then you want to do it under ideal conditions if you do it at all. Mm hmm. And let's talk about the patriarchy. Um, OK. Do you do you think the patriarchy is natural, given what you know about the history of our like biological bodies? Like, is it natural to live in a society that privileges the wants of men over the health of reproductive females and young? Let's break the question down a little bit. Now, that last part of your question, the is it fair, is it moral, in other words? Yeah, no, obviously not. Obviously, the the ethical thing is to reduce the suffering of all, right? Is it is it biologically smart? Right now, it is not. Whether or not it was like a million years ago or at some point along the evolutionary chain, maybe. But here's what I mean by that. Not for privileging the desires of males, no, 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 no. Um, but by doing everything you can to reduce the reproductive mayhem that is our body plan, right? Sure, right? So the big thing about our species is that we build up a bunch of behavioral workarounds. In other words, our bodies suck and we do things to overcome the deep innate suckage of our bodies, okay? 
So, and that's what tool use is. That's what deep society building is. That's what all of our behavior is about. Not just what we are, but what we do with what we are, right? So if gynecology is one side of a coin where we are using behavioral workarounds to build up medical knowledge over deep time, help each other give birth, maybe eventually, I guess, put a placenta in a pill. I don't know where to put that in the deep evolution, <laughs> you know, of like gynecology, California. but you're here and we are part of the same species. And yeah, that's part of the story, apparently. Who knows if uh -huh. that's going to pan out in the long run, but like uh -huh. that's part of it. But in deep time, right? Millions of years. Well, the flip side of that behavioral coin is what I call in the book sex rules, or which is a subset of sexism, right? Think about it again like a biologist and sort of this is a little bit of a bitter pill, but let's swallow it for a second. You know, the outcomes are good and ignore the matrix. All right. Okay. So if you can fix your birth problems by helping each other give birth. You can also fix your birth problems by creating cultural rules around when and how males have access to female bodies. Every known human culture now and hist historically has sex rules which regulate access to female bodies. Where can she go in a given day? How much of her body can be seen? by whom, what she can do with that body, how she arrives at the moment of potentially sexy fun times. What does that sexy fun time involve? Does it involve the whole body, part of the body? We all have different rules around access to female bodies, every human culture, and they're often quite different. It's not even so simple as liberal versus conservative. Like if you look globally at all human cultures that we know anything about, we all have sex rules and we all feel strongly about them. We just have different rules. But what those sex rules do from a biologist's point of view is it intervenes on her fertility, right? Mm -hmm. It creates behavioral rules that the culture strongly maintains and reinforces. Males and females alike, by the way, this is a biologist's answer to why are chicks so sexist and reinforce sexist rules. It's not just internalized sexism. It's a long chain of we're all culture makers and weirdly deeply part of culture and humanity is building sex rules, right? We can't help but feel strongly about them, but we're gonna feel as strongly about our new feelings about being, being poly, let's say in a very small subset of human culture in mostly America, but a bit of Europe, uh, as we do about strong sexist rules that say chicks can't have sex unless it's a husband, right? But the thing is, the thing is, is that if the ultimate goal then, again, thinking just like a biologist, if the ultimate effect is making more women and girls survive and thrive, well then gynecology is way better at that now. Like so much better. We have vastly outpaced any usefulness, biologically speaking, of these sex rules with just having a good OBGYN and having decent birth control than we do in the vast majority of the sex rules. Uh, and the sex rules now actually kill a lot of women and girls and reduce their health overall. Hmm. So it seems sort of like patriarchy in terms of biology has out overstayed its welcome overstayed its usefulness in, in certain applications of patriarchy in the way that it, it plays out on female bodies and reproduction. Um, that's, that's the lay of the like. land I'm seeing. But yes, I absolutely think that um, from a scientific point of view, a lot of the sexist rules around women and sexuality that's tied to what we usually call the patriarchy has long outstayed its wel welcome. It's definitely negatively impacting the health of, well, everybody at this point. You write about how contemporary sexist beliefs impacted research and discovery in history. Um, you're also, you also mentioned that research around queer and non-binary and trans bodies is limited because of gender roles kind of reaching their tentacles into everything. Have you noticed this changing for the better? Are we learning more about the bodies and the biology of people who don't fit into the male-female dichotomy? Yes, thank God. Um, or whatever you happen to believe in. I'm an atheist. But yes, 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 yes. I mean, it's slow going. Okay. So one of the important things to assume is that given that uh, trans and non-binary folk are a percentage of the human population and presumably evenly distributed, why wouldn't they be? That's true of other sorts of queerity. Why wouldn't it be here? Right? That any given set of research probably had some trans and non-binary folk in the closet in their subject pool. And that would have always been true. But the thing is, is that you can't analyze for difference if you don't know that. 
right? So that's the tricky thing. So that means there's probably a lot that we could have known but didn't because of bigotry, right? Mm. Just because yeah. of bigotry, just that right there, making their lives terrible. It's also true that um, because female bodies were excluded in one way or another, both in rats and in human beings in biology, because that was the cheap way of controlling for the messiness of the estrus cycle, uh, which I can get into, but I don't need to right now, right? In other words, just know that we were mostly studying male rats. It was just dicks all the way down and true in dogs and true in pig and true in human beings. That was the picture we were building until fairly recently, the last decade or two of research. That also means that like half of all mammals just weren't being looked at. And that was true in human beings too. I think the really awesome news is that now that we are becoming more very slowly, actually, there's a lot of pushback, but we're working on it, tolerant of all different types of queerity, gender identity, and sexual orientation in our society. That means that we can ask more serious questions about how and when that might matter for your health, right? Mm -hmm. And how and when that might matter in terms of learning more things about how the body works in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, um, one of the really awesome papers that I read uh, was about how uh, trans women um, taking a lot of estrogen, for example, and a lot of androgen blockers tend to have healthier cardiovascular systems after about a decade of doing that. One of the things that we don't often talk about is that actually being a male mammal makes you really physically vulnerable. We usually talk hmm. about male mammals being super strong. You know, you picture your Schwarzeneggers right there. They've got a lot of muscle and all that, but actually Men die sooner, okay? The female body is better at not dying. That is true across mammals. But the interesting thing about it is that part of that may be tied to their androgens. Specific specifically, it kind of makes their cardiovascular system a bit more crap. They get more heart attacks. They get more um, peripheral vascular disease. And it advances sooner in their lives than it does in people with ovaries. Well, what's interesting is that trans women, we now have a study on it, who have been on uh, estrogens to better present their gender identity, tend to have better heart measures. So long as they didn't smoke, please nobody smoke. Smoking is terrible for you. If you smoke, it doesn't matter what your gender is, is bad, right? Um, but otherwise, right? And that's a thing that we wouldn't have known if we'd never done that study. We would never have had a useful measure for what happens when you add a lot of freaking estrogen to an otherwise typically male Y chromosome testicle having body, right? Mm -hmm. Unless we had actually studied trans people. So I would love to enroll more trans folk in studies, please, because it's actually going to save a lot of men's lives. Yeah, we're already good as women at, at living for a long time. But it sounds like in the book, you, you, you even talked about uh, the role of female hormones in helping recover from head injuries, which I found to be super fascinating. Yeah. I mean, is that is that some sort of future possible treatment that we're unlocking by studying the way that female hormones can like help men recover from injury or avoid health catastrophe? Yeah. Short answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. We're looking into what estradiol, that's E2, you have a bunch of different estrogens, that's one of them, can do in emergency settings. Because it does seem to be true that female skin in many circumstances recovers from many different kinds of wounds better with less scarring. That's a thing, okay? Except in the burn unit, and that just sucks, and that has to do with surface area and inflammation, and I won't get into the nitty gritty. Like, definitely don't get burned. Anyway, but if you do happen to get hit in the head with a tire iron, and I hope that doesn't happen to anyone listening uh, and not you either, Aaron, it is true that your prognosis would be better when you arrive in the ER, assuming you're not already dead, than a male with the exact same injury. And it has something to do with how that brain tissue is responding to local inflammation. Basically, and we're still unlocking how, but there seems to be something protective about female hormone profiles. There seems to be something protective in how your actual even neurons respond to local inflammation, even without your estrogens, right? For some reason, just having two X chromosomes make your, makes your neurons better at not killing themselves in response to other dead cells around them. All of this is hmm. great. All of this is good. We like that. We like surviving. We're trying to figure out we being science, you know, not specifically me or you, but <laughs> science. We're trying to figure out whether or not a bolus of estradiol or some other kind of hormone thing 
could help these patients have a better prognosis and when that window of treatment might be. Like, do we need to do it in the ER? Do we need to give it to the people if they're going to hit you in the head with a tire iron, then they have to give it to you? Because if they're hitting you in the head with a tire iron, they're very unlikely to then immediately begin treatment. You know, like just (laughs) motivation wise, like that's probably not what they're after. But yeah, like we don't know exactly when, but no, there's a lot of different research going on. It does seem to be true that maybe one of the better ways to help male bodies survive is to temporarily in specific ways make them more female just for a hot minute, just for a sec. Since putting out the book, have you stumbled into more questions, like big questions that you didn't get a chance to pursue when you were writing Eve? Well, I mean, the book used to be like 150 pages longer, and it's not a short book. So I love my editors. It was my first book. Had to figure out how to do things like write a book. Um, But sure, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't include. Um, There was a lot of stuff about why female bodies seem to be better at the general not dying thing. Um, There was a lot of stuff about castration, actually, that I've largely been doing live as opposed to... uh, in the book itself, they were a little worried that somehow my male readers might, you know, have a little shrinkage <laughs> in uh, in response to my advocating that they remove their balls. Uh, which is, I'm not, I'm not actually saying, I'm not actually saying everyone should get castrated. I'm just saying that of men who have been castrated historically, they live longer, healthier lives. That's just a thing. <laughs> That's a thing that's true. That's a thing that's true across mammals and in human beings. It'll actually add 14 years on average to your life. Some live way longer. Don't do this at home, please. But it's true. But that that I did not that I did not put in. But that does mean I've gotten a lot of questions like in my signing lines specifically about balls now. Ever since I was like on The Daily Show, talked about some balls and elsewhere talking about balls. Like now guys really want to know, for example, will a vasectomy be enough? Like, do I have to remove them or can I just, and unfortunately you would have to remove them, guys. Sorry to get the 14 oh. years you do. Yeah, oh, I know. That's, I know. that's a shame. I mean, not very it many is. people are seeing those theoretically, but if you have to look at it every day, I mean, I don't know. That's that's a pretty important you part know, of it. You know, and it seems to matter when in your life you do it. So like at the point that guys start worrying about their end times, you know, their end of life, it probably isn't going to make nearly as much difference. So just consider them the little furry friends that you have and are slightly murdery, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, just tuck them away. I know they sweat a lot. The sweat goes down when you get older. I've learned that too. You know, less sweaty balls as you get older. They're longer well, because of gravity but less sweaty. So that's such great information. It's I'm so glad to know. That <laughs> you should write a book about balls next and I will actually I will buy it. I will buy a book that you write about balls because I enjoyed Eve, how the female body drove 200 million years of human evolution so much. Kat Bohannon, thank you so much for joining us. This sure. is a great conversation. I loved the book. Listeners, if you're interested at all in what we're talking about, go out and buy it immediately. It's so good. Or you can borrow my copy. But there's probably a lot more of you and the waiting list will be long. Bye.